Hello folks and welcome back for the most exciting and least optimized playthrough of Borderlands 2 that you ever did see and you are joining us right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of Captain Scarlet and her Pirate's Booty DLC. That means that we reached a point in the main game where I got kind of bored with it because I played it so many freaking times and I said I need to shake things up. I totally forgot about the how awesome the Sand Hawk, I believe is the name of the game. It's the oh, name of the game. The name of the the SMG that you get here for one of the side quests. I forgot how freaking awesome that is with the B. So I was not thinking about that when I went here, but we will in fact pull that, get get that weapon, and uh, I think we'll put it to some good use if I remember correctly. But here's a great thing, folks. This is a, this is a tragic and, and scary thing. This is my second time doing the commentary on this playthrough. I, I it is one of going to be one of life's great mysteries that I will probably never know the answer to. Somehow I shot and edited this my commentary on this exact video, rendered it out compressed it and created a thumbnail for it and yet I do not have that video anywhere don't know where it is and I didn't even notice that it was missing until I went back and looked at the channel and saw wait a minute why is there why has it been two weeks since the last Borderland upload I did episode 16 I remember doing it I remember uploading it it's not on YouTube not on Rumble it's just not there and I'm not saying that I uploaded it and it's been taken down I just I don't know what happened to it. the only thing I can think is I got in a very, a very uh, ambitious mood one day. Probably it was a Sunday. Similar, no, not too unlike this day. Where I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to do like a Mario RPG. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do like set a bunch of different stuff up is pretty much the idea. So I had like six or seven different thumbnails on my desktop to, to be, you know, used for the upload. I had about four or five different videos. I had uploaded some stuff that I did on YouTube, um, streams that I done on YouTube. I recorded, had recorded those, and I was up getting those uploaded on Rumble as just videos. And I'm I, the only thing I think is I somehow deleted it before I got it uploaded. And 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 here's the thing: I will say this for for as much as as much as I'm willing to concede that both Mac and uh, Microsoft have their have their pros and cons. Mac will not delete something in your recycle bin unless you tell it to. Windows, I have noticed, maybe it's just the version I have, maybe it's just there's something wrong, there's a virus, I don't know, but my recycle bin gets cleaned, got cleaned out. Like I was keeping stuff specifically there because I didn't I didn't want it, you know, mucking up other stuff, but I was like, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, like I'm never going to delete something until I know for a fact that it's been uploaded or that it's in circulation or that it got to where it needs to be. But when I sometimes I've gone to that recycle bin and it's been empty, I'm like, I know I did not empty it. I should have about seven videos in here, and maybe there's a time limit. I could look into that. It would take a little bit of research on my part, so I'm not going to, not going to mess with it. But the bottom line, folks, is yeah, it feels bad. I, I hate doing the exact same thing over again. My only my only small consolation is I'm pretty sure it was a low it was low energy or it became low energy very quick, and I think there were places on there where I just kind of spaced out. So the only reason why this doesn't really feel like a kick in the creative groin is I think I have to do very little to make this a better video from a commentary standpoint than what it was the original. Because uh, when you do it, at the end of it, if I'm like, oh my gosh, I was tired, that sucked, I'm still not going to do it again because, you know, it, it, it's the best that I could do at the time. And if I, if I tried to perfect every single performance... I would never get anything done because it's not scripted. It's going to be less than ideal. There's going to be moments where I'm like, oh, oh it's going on. It's going on. You know, it's, even, even on this one, I guarantee you, as awesome as I sound right now, the energy will abate at some point during this one hour playthrough, and it just, it just happens. And I've just learned happily and sadly. I, I learned, first learned this with my hair. Now you, you can see I have I've what I think they, they, uh, Jerry Rice had a. They called him Poodle, and actually, yeah, actually, no, Poodle Boy, my, my good buddy George. Shout out to George, my my older and seasoned compadre and co-worker uh, in a warehouse back in 2003. He used to call me Poodle Boy because this is my hair. This is not a perm. This is also not a brag. I'm not bragging about my hair. I'm just saying I, it is not this way because I chose for it to be this way. When I get out of the shower, I, I actually I, I put conditioner. After I get out of the shower, I put conditioner in my hair, just like a little a little dollop, and just run it through and just shake it around or whatever, and that's about it. That's that's how you get this. I cut my own hair. I've cut my own hair since college. Well, yeah, yeah, college actually. I, I've not paid for a haircut in like 20 years. And you may be thinking, going, 
I'm not really watching the gameplay here. Borderlands isn't all that fascinating. I'm fascinated with you talking about your hair. And I'm looking at your hair right now. I'm fascinated by this thing. And I'm very surprised that you cut your own hair. That's probably not what's happening at all. Don't look at my hair. Look at the game. Watch what's happening. I'm running towards the rust yards. We're going to see... Uh, uh, what's his face? Herbert. He's disgusting. Incredibly disgusting. There is no attempt made to make him pleasant. Even amongst the denizens of Pandora. It's very strange. He is kind of... Well, the guy you're looking for, I there brought him on board a few months back because he's stupidly knowledgeable about Captain Blade's treasure. Then I kicked him off because you'll, you'll see. See, the fact she didn't kill him is a little off character. I, I allow it for games like Borderlands 2 because reasons. Uh, I mean, it's it's asks about me. Don't say anything. Like she she's grossed out by him. But we've seen her dispatch, and we know that she's capable of dispatching people that she doesn't like on a whim. And the only possible reason you can give, and it's not given in-game, but I'm willing to allow them this, is that even though she was repulsed by him and didn't like him, and she was able to curb her disgust and disdain enough to just have him kicked out of the group versus killing him, is because in the back of her mind she's thinking, but he may, I may still want him to get the compass or you know there, there, he may he may be of yet use to me i just can't don't want to have him around i will 100 percent. i'll take that reason like i said i don't think she it's mentioned why she does but obviously the fact that we're on this question he has something that she wants means but why she wouldn't just take it it's like he has a piece of the compass why she wouldn't just take it kill him i don't know i mean then this, uh, you need the story to happen and in a, in a more story centric environment like a movie or a show I'd, I'd be a little bit miffed about that because I do think it's, it's a character thing her character she's introduced as being very ruthless and not very compassionate she's and, and, and I'm not saying that's you know it makes for a bad character it's just that's you know the character you, you, you mess her, you mess with her you betray her you do something stupid you creep her out she'll kill you uh, if you I, she's not one I don't think that you if you were insult her she would do that especially if it was in, in as a jest she seems like somebody would just roll with that and maybe even lean into it. But she does strike me as someone who, once she determines that you are not, you're more of a detriment than, a, than an asset, she'll just off you. And so, to have a character like Herbert, or, yeah, Her, yeah, Herbert. Um, I just kept saying Herbert. I was like, wait, the Hermit? Find the Hermit. I was like, why don't they say find Herbert? But whatever, it's, we're finding the Hermit. Whose name is Herbert? Herbert the Herbert. Herbert the Hermit. Whatever. You know, and so it's, it's, it's the same thing, folks. It's the same thing why so many of us got cheesed off when Lucas tried to pull the whole sh Greedo shot first thing. Because it speaks to Han's character and to his development and to his growth as a character. Well, not even that. Not even that. Let's, let's not go there. I'm, I, I, I've made this point before on a, on a different video discussion. You know, what we consider to be good and, and bad. A good guy throwing dirt in a bad guy's face during a fight is, does not make the good guy bad. doesn't make him just as bad as the bad guy. If you're fighting for your life, you do whatever you gotta do. You gouge out eyes, you kick him in the groin, you bite, you scratch. You do whatever you freaking need to do to stay alive. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if it, 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 you don't have to play fair. Now, I would say you don't, you're not gonna, a, a good guy does not threaten the life of somebody. Like, you're not gonna be like, you know, a villain grabbing a random hostage, holding a gun and saying, and would, which wouldn't work against a villain anyway. The villain doesn't care. But like, that's, that's a thing you don't do. You don't bring somebody else. You, you like, your desire for self-preservation does not, should not mean that other people's lives are now put at risk because of, in order for you to preserve your life, Innocent people who are not involved are now going to pay the price for it. That doesn't mean that you're, if you're not fighting and there is collateral damage or something happens that it's, you know, that's your fault or you're a bad person. But, yeah, like a good guy wouldn't put a gun to somebody's head and say, surrender now or I'll kill the girl. Like I said, it wouldn't work against a bad guy. Bad guy doesn't give a fig. Can work against a good guy. Uh, perhaps a naive good guy. Like, if you are if you think you're fighting for your life, if you think the person across from you wants to kill you and that they're not going to kill you if you do what they want or that they're not going to kill that person if, if you do what they want. I mean, why why would they leave somebody alive who can... who is a witness to them murdering you? You know, it's, it's, it's a little murky at that point. But bottom line is, aside from that, in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, if you think your life is being threatened and somebody's trying to kill you, you do whatever you got to do to live. 
And so Han Solo shooting Greedo under the table, yeah, it wasn't playing fair, but there's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't even think it's a character arc for Han Solo. Like, Han Solo in Return of the Jedi, I would expect and hope he would do the exact same gosh darn thing. Because if there's a bounty hunter there and, and you say over my dead body and he says, that's the idea? This guy's, I mean, you know, in theory, he, uh, Jabba, you know, dead or alive. Well, in theory, Jabba would have said alive, but most of the time, bounties are dead or alive. You know, the person wanting them is, unless they have a specific reason, because, you know, Greedo said he may just take your ship. Well, he could take your ship if you're dead or alive. So, allowing yourself to be at the mercy of somebody who you have really no reason to think has any incentive to keep you alive, and even if that person does, that they are taking you to somebody who does not have the desire to keep you alive, as Greedo expressed, you know, that's the idea, over your dead body. He's going to take your ship. You don't need to justify shooting first. There's no, it doesn't make you a bad person for trying to preserve your own life. And, and it's a circular thing. See, Because here's the thing, folks. Here's the thing. If Jabba was the type of employer that said, you know what, you, you, okay, you ruined my spice, or you, you lost my spice, whatever, you're going to owe me. You're going to, you know, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do a few odd jobs for me that, uh, which, in which the services of for which the services would normally be would equate to the amount of money that you lost me. Like, if, if it was that kind of thing where, hey, you're a valuable resource, I don't want to lose you, but I'm also, you've also lost me, you jettisoned my spice, which I understand you had to do it, doesn't mean it was it was your responsibility, you were the one who needed to find it another way, uh, ret you needed to retrieve it. Once you took that from me, you, you assumed responsibility for that product until it was delivered to where it needed to go. Because you did, you failed to do that, you now owe me, whether you need, you need to either pay me for it, or you need to pay it in services, or yeah, I'll just take, I'll take, I'll garnish your wages. You know, every job you do for me, I take 50% of that job until you pay back the 300,000 of spice. Like, I'm not gonna charge you interest because it's not about that, it's just, I can't function as a loss. You see, I'm, tr I'm trying to be the rational gangster here, which may never work, but it's good music right here. I think I mentioned that in the first one too. It's and the first time we hear it is in the, the first time I heard it was in the Thanksgiving, the Waddle Gobbler DLC, uh, the DLC, Headhunter, um, kind of expansion thing. That's the same music that plays when you're in the kitchen and you're fighting all the chefs trying to cook the, 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 the pie for the, the gobbler. Anywho. So it may not work, but I, I just I kind of think that, so. You, but Jabba makes that creates that situation himself. If, if it makes if if Han Solo, if you're if you're people running spice for you, people smuggling for you, have it in their heads. You're not. It's not that you want to be compensated. That you are going to take your pound of flesh and or kill them because they failed you. Then you now put that person in a situation where any bounty for them is rightly assumed to be something that will end in their death or in a horrible fate. Whereas if you are Strict but firm. I, you know, you, again, you can't run a business at a loss. And you say, okay, I've given you the spice. You now owe, you You are now in charge of 8,000 credits worth of product. If it does not get there, it's on you. Meaning you either pay me for that or, like I said, yeah, we'll, garner, we'll figure out something. You're, you're, that needs to be paid for, uh, including the profit. So if it's 8,000 credits worth but that we are selling for 12, whatever whatever you, Jabba is going to get for that spice shipment, Han is responsible for giving that to Jabba. You don't take the guy's ship because he can't, he can't make any money that way and the ship probably isn't worth that much regardless. And in theory, Han, because there is that, that cut scene between Jabba and Han where Jabba says, hey, Han, my boy, which originally I think he was like a baron. He kind of looked like a baron. He had like a... Like a hairy coat or something. He's a, he's a portly gentleman, but he w didn't have a tail. He, w he wasn't a blub. He wasn't Jabba. He wasn't an alien. He was like a humanoid guy, and he was like, "Gone, oh, my boy." You know, I can't have you doing this. And, but it was it was it was a little bit more of that amicable thing. And and so in in light of that, oh, he said, "Oh, why'd you have to fry poor Greedo like that?" That it, having that scene in there does confuse things a little bit because it looks like Jabba could have killed Han if he wanted to. And, and when he said, why'd you have to kill Greedo like that? I get it. If, if, and maybe that's, okay. I, I'm trying to, uh, right now I just had an epiphany, a minor epiphany. Why Lucas, because he made a stupid decision, 
had to make another stupid decision, and here it is. You leave the freaking Star Wars movie alone. I get that it's your baby, but it became popular. It became it, it got you the prestige and the money and the everything you got because the fans liked the movie that they saw. They didn't like they didn't fall in love with what you could have made or what you wanted to make. They fell in love with and paid for what you actually made. If you want to do a movie like Return of the Jedi, which is essentially just an upgrade in almost every aspect of New Hope, i.e. better lightsaber fights, higher emotional stakes, better dog fights, more fighters, faster dog fight, more uh, a, a much more robust and engaging third act where you actually have three battles going on at the same time, where your Death Star is not only bigger but looks a lot cooler because it's not just a big giant ball. A big giant ball, mind you. Big giant ball. You know, the fact that it looks like, you know, a floating golf ball versus what the second Death Star looked like, which I think is probably the most creative and terrifying and cool looking way to depict a sphere or a sphere in construction ever. Like you look at it, you, just, you feel like you're looking at the at the, at the inside, the inner workings of this, this terrifying thing. Once, once it's finished, it's a ball. It's not terrifying. It, it, a sphere is not really all that scary to me. The incomplete Death Star that can fire, that has the destructive power of the Death Star or something close, that's terrifying. I think I think the, the second Death Star is infinitely better than the first one. So you want to do that. You want you want to say, okay, I didn't like the Mall Sites of Canteen. I didn't like the way it turned out. I'm creating Java's Palace to show what we can actually do with it and, and how awesome we can be with our puppets. That's fine. Stop re-releasing the original trilogy, the original movies with and keep adding changes. So what what Harris, what uh, Lucas did is reinserted the scene with Jabba talking to Han. And as I said, if, if I'm not mistaken, the original footage of it is is a male, it's, it's, a, it's a humanoid person. It doesn't have a tail or anything. That's why you have that awkward moment where like Han steps on Jabba's tail and has to step over it because it's like he would have to because Jabba's of, of where their positioning is. But it was originally a human being there, so that that was not choreographed. But because he added that and he gave Jabba a much more benevolent vibe, and he's like, "Why'd you have to kill poor Greedo?" Obviously, Jabba's not mourning the loss of Greedo. Jabba's not that compassionate. But the fact that he probably, in every way, shape, and form, has Han dead to rights at that moment and doesn't kill him means. Yeah, Han was a it was excessive force. Han didn't need to shoot Greedo. Like Greedo's like I'm gonna take you to, to Jabba, and clearly Jabba isn't all that bad of a bad of a guy. But so but and and, and but that that scene didn't need to be added. We did not need to see Han talking to Jabba, especially because. Uh, that Jabba is different in the first one than the last one. I know it may seem more like, um, you know, um, continuity, uh, or, uh, but really not. It's not even a continuity thing. It's just okay. Here's Jabba in this one, but the problem is that Jabba and Return of the Jedi Jabba, they they look vastly different, size wise, color wise, everything. Because one's completely 100% CG, completely. I don't know why I feel the need to emphasize. What I'm saying by repeating, by, by using synonyms for the exact same word, but whatever. We're getting closer to Herbert's place. Not a good sign. Creepy old bastard. But anyway. I, I remember getting lost. Every time I go through this playthrough, I always get lost here. Because there's always enough time between the playthroughs that I'm like, Oh, crap, where do I gotta go? I gotta get up there, but the map's saying it's there, but it's actually on the second level. But there's nothing to indicate that it's at a different elevation, so I kind of have to figure that out. And Anyway. So by adding that part in there, it it not only does it screw with things because you're looking, wait, that's supposed to be Jabba? That doesn't look anything like, and he doesn't behave anything like Jabba in the, the last one. And that's only nine years away, or, or roughly that, maybe not even that long. So for Jabba to get that big and look that different, and, and it's just CG just wasn't there. For, for organic beings, for metallic or, or um, like machine things, things with, with rough edges and... and you know, mechanical movements. I think CG was was adequate. Starships, things like that. Yeah, you could get away with it. But organic stuff was we weren't ready for that. So not only are you reinserting a scene 
needlessly, it, it lends nothing at all to the narrative, needlessly, that actually requires you to use technology that really is not is not up to the task at that time. But now you kind of have to change it in a way because it looks like Han was overreacting. Han was aggressive. Whereas in the original story, when, as I said, when, when, Han, when Greedo says, when Han says over my dead body, and Greedo says that's the idea, the inference is either Greedo and or Jabba are, are, are probably going to kill Han. And so Han is therefore justified in killing Greedo. If, if Jabba was the nice guy that he seems to be, more or less, uh, seems to be in... Because you don't know, we don't know anything about Jabba. Like, if you were just watching New Hope, you haven't seen Jedi yet. Jabba does seem like he says, "Oh, why'd you, Han? Oh, no, why'd you have to kill poor Greedo?" And you know, Han, my boy. You know, he's very, he's very fatherly. He's very whatever. And, and their relationship seems to be more or less cordial. So you're not really expecting. I don't remember all the lines. So maybe Jabba does give a, either a veiled threat or a, an outright one. But overall, you get the the feel that you know they've they've got a, a long la long term um, business related friendship of sorts. And, you know, yeah, uh, yeah, Jabba's not going to let him off the hook. And he's not going to be like, ah, don't worry about paying me back, man. It's all good. We're buddies. But he's also not stupid enough to be like, ah, I'm going to kill you and steal your ship and just whatever. He's like, you're, you're, you're a great smuggler. And you know, I want to keep you around, but I, I got I to gotta hold your feet to the fire on this one. You know, I need to get my money back. Which I think is fair. You know, and, and hey, you know, you don't like it, don't smuggle. Illegal spice. Or regular spice, especially if it's cilantro. Don't 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 bother peddling that devil spice to people. But because of that insertion, it does make Han's action to be a bit out of place. Hold on a second, Scarlet. There he is. Is that you? And all his creepiness. Just a little bit obsessed. No, you're not Scarlet. I can taste her scent on you. She wants the last compass piece, doesn't she? Oh, yeah. Let's talk, you and me. No, that's not a great idea. And I remember last time thinking, I don't go into that room because it's so disgusting, but I'm pretty sure after we turn in the compass, or... If I, help you I think it's... Compass, yeah. Scarlet I, I'm so pretty sure we happy. do go in there at one point, and oh, it's, it's a mistake. Yes. It's, it's grody. But no, the compass alone won't do. She needs to know how much I care. The tapes. Yes. Get the tapes. Get the tapes. I'll mark them on your echo. Yeah, it's a little it's a little thin. The the idea that one now not uh, an obsessed person definitely like him would definitely think yeah, in addition I want you to give her the compass with these tapes that show how much I care about her. Why they're scattered all over the place, how they're intact but scattered all over, it's a little... <laughs> like, why he wouldn't have them with him, why he wouldn't have given them to her earlier. Like, his rationale, you don't need to explain, but... You know, some of the, some of the quests, you'd like them to make a little more sense, be a little more like, okay, I, I get this. This just seems like, okay, yeah, we... we this is, this is a way, a very contrived way of giving you a, a hunt and fetch quest. And it's really not all that... I'm, I'm not a big fan of this part of the... Part of the game. I, I, I like I like being under Oasis. I like the water, you know, the, the area where it feels very piratey. This feels a little more like the first one, but not quite. It does it doesn't have the vibe of the first one, but it has the aesthetics of it. Uh, the first Borderlands game, I mean. And so it's kind of it does it doesn't give me the isolation, but at the same time, it doesn't. Uh, it, it's it, it's just not my kind of landscape. I'm not a big desert person, you know. Dune, eh. Tatooine, eh. Jojobu or whatever the crap that knockoff Tatooine and Disney Star Wars is. Jakku, I think is actually what it's called. Nah, just don't like deserts. Uh, Mad Max, don't like deserts. Post-apocalyptic worlds in general, like deserts. It's not fun. I, li I like lush forest maybe not you know not like you know rainforest like predator i mean i, I like that well enough but more like an indoor uh, that's kind of my my vibe my my jam is you know that kind of forested greenery lush but not sweaty i don't know what i'm talking about anyway 
That's the first time, honestly, that I've, I've understood possibly why Lucas felt compelled to have uh, Greedo shoot first. It's still stupid. Like, I would look at it and go, okay, if I this is what I need to do. If I need to have a guy shoot point-blank range, literally two feet away from me, okay, maybe a meter away, then I'm going to have to have him miss in order for this scene to work. I would, I'd say, okay, scrap it. And, well, that means we kind of have to scrap putting Jabba in there, because Jabba seems like a, a, a reasonable guy. Okay, then we scrap that, too. It was fine the way it was. It was better the way it was. A mercenary, a smuggler, like... It says a lot about Han's character that he, you know, then did what he did. It showed he was not... I don't know, it, but again, it doesn't even show that he's bad. It just shows, okay, he's... He, his his coolness during that essentially said, hey, uh, I'm kind of a badass. Uh, not a badass. That's not a badass. I'm... This is this is not the first time this has happened. I'm. It is not the first time I had my life threatened. It's not the first time I've had to take a life. It's not the first time that you know I kind of got the drop on somebody who was who thought they had the drop on me. But to be fair, let, let's 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 you know compare Indiana Jones too. He does the exact same thing. You got the guy with the sword, ah, and he just pulls out a revolver and shoots the guy and puts it back in and looks away like it was no big deal. So I, I'm not I'm not gonna lie, folks. I am. Well, okay. All right. And I do apologize. This is going to be a this is a little bit Star Wars heavy. Hopefully, if you're here for the Borderlands, because all we do it's a hunt and fetch quest. I'll, I'll try to shut down a little bit when we get to the tape so you can hear uh, the disturbing things that that what's his name says. But um, yeah, we're just we're not really advancing the story so much. We're just we're hunting for these tapes, and they're just uh, proof of what's his name's creepiness. But yeah, um, you know, what was I saying? Something about the jump on the shoot first. And, uh... Yeah, career-wise, I, I saw enough of, of like when I, growing up, I remember most of the adults that I would talk to, like my, even my parents, when I talk about Star Wars, and they they were like, eh, uh, Mark Hamill, he, he was he was okay as Luke. He's not a great actor. And I was like, no, oh, because I'm thinking of, like, for me, like, the, the pinnacle for him, at least in this, the trilogy, was when he's, when he finds out Vader's his father, his reaction to that I thought was very visceral and very, I mean, his face did do some weird things, but, I mean, that, you could tell that was just some raw emotion of just, like, despair and disbelief and hurt and just, this can't be right. I thought, I thought my dad was this awesome hero guy who was betrayed by this nasty villain. And instead, he is the villain. That, that's a painful thing to go through. Right? Especially when he has searched his feelings and he knows it to be true. And also, while he probably wasn't thinking about this at the time, you know, the, the facts, Obi-Wan lied to him. Well, from a certain point of view. Again, ret retconning, uh, I'll forgive it, but it's still a retcon. We know it. Everybody knows it. And that does lend to some understandable frustration with Obi-Wan. Sorry. Love letters. What an interesting way to phrase it. Ah, I cannot believe I, I've, I've lost. We lost an entire episode. We lost a week's worth and an episode's worth. So now it's like just to just to get back to where I'm supposed to be. I should be doing two of these today. But that's kind of a lot. Because I have to do one for Mario RPG as well. So, I don't know. I, but I do think I, I've, I've transferred over a little bit more to streaming, live streaming. And I think that's just better overall. It allows for the interaction that I think makes playthroughs like this more worthwhile. At least the, the type of playthrough that I like to see. And it means that I don't have to... I mean, it, really, you're doubling up. It's like you play for an hour and then you record for an hour versus it just being playing and recording for an hour. For you, the end user, it's the same same thing. It's one hour of content, but for me, it's two hours worth of doing stuff. And it's not the end of the world, but I just don't think... And that was really... Look at that perspective! What is that? We, we look like a doll. We are not that far below the guy. Like, that made... I mean, that would only work if he was on a, a cliff and we were, like, 30 feet below him. That, that was just a... That was weird. I remember that in the first one as well. Very bizarre. 
But yeah, so, but like, so that you had that performance from Mark, and when he's writhing on the floor in Jedi, when he's being struck by lightning. I mean, you gotta remember, on a, on a set, it's probably completely quiet. There, there's no special effects, there's no music, nothing. It, and, and there's no lightning. The lightning is all there, it's all done in special effects afterward. Pretty much painting the electricity on the film, or on a piece of film, something. It's added later. So this poor this guy. Now there is light effects, so I do think maybe there was somebody there with a, like a strobe or something. I, I've never seen the behind the scenes on that, but I'm guessing they had something because you see the light on his face. So I think they had a light or a strobe light or something off to the side. It was like simulating, you know, what what it would be like if the lightning was actually going off. But that's it. That's all you got. Like I said, no music, no sound effects, just a guy laying on the floor. Spasming, writhing, oh gosh, oh, doing all this stuff, and just like pretend you're getting hit by lightning, <laughs> you know. And I think he does a very good job of of doing that. Like I really think he's being electrocuted, even as an adult. I'm like, it looks like he's actually getting zapped by this stuff. And they do a great job with the lightning, crawling it over his body and having it respond to him. And you see it like go around his teeth and everything. It's it's really cool. So that's what I'm thinking when I'm thinking good acting, because to me that is, that requires some chops. It requires some imagination. Thank you. you got a nice butt. You also got a nice chest. Your face is okay too. No, six syllables, dice. Oh, it's ruined. God damn it. I can't appreciate it. It's the juxtaposition of somebody as unrefined and huh, kind of grotesque and primitive seeming as Herbert, but yet knows the, the the rules of a haiku and, and gets furious. Not that his haiku is very unflattering. And kind of back ass words. You start with the face, my man. You start with the face. But that he... It's just because this, the, the, he has too many syllables that he gets pissed off about it. I I can appreciate that. The, ref, the, the refinement in the rough, I guess, is a, a way of thinking of it. Uh, it. It lends itself well to comedy. In my opinion. But bottom line is, I don't think... Mark Hamill, as a voice actor, he's fine. But as an actual actor, I don't think he's that great. And I haven't seen a lot of other things. I know he's in something called Guyver. Or he's a wing commander. I haven't seen a ton of the stuff. But looking at like the outtakes, the, 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 the performances he gave that were not used... Now, granted, they're outtakes. They're outtakes for a reason. They're, or they're, they're, they're shots that were not used for a reason. He was able to give, for the most part, a good performance in the movie, but uh, even in those, there are moments where you go, he's a little, he's not, it's not quite as natural, he's a little stiff, and I think, and I've heard people say, and I've only seen Force Awakens one time, and I tried to forget about it, because I was not a fan, but the little bit that I do remember, kind of the same thing, Daisy Ridley, she has... She can do, like, just like Mark, she, she can do, like, intense emotion, like, she can cry. I think that's even, they, I heard somewhere, I'm not, I'm not declaring this to be truth, but I heard somewhere that part of the appeal was they were impressed that she could cry on cue, that she could actually, like, emote like that on cue. Whether that's true or not, I mean, it could very well be people of, like, directors cast for various reasons, so it's not the most absurd thing, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang my hat on that. But she does, she does well with that. Like, she does good when she's, you know, screaming and showing emotion, kind of like Mark Hamill. But in general, a little bit stiff, a little, you know, doesn't, doesn't quite feel that natural. But to be fair, folks, and this, I'm not trying to cast shade, but I don't know how Harrison Ford got where he's like, Indiana Jones and uh, Han Solo are not that different. Like it's it's not like he showed some great range with those, and neither of those are really different from his the smaller role that he had in American Graffiti. It's the smug, you know, half cocked smile. Um, you know, I, I would say ladies man, but ha, Harrison Ford does not do a great like I'm macking on the gal right now. Like there's some guys that are just smooth. Will Smith, I think, if I recall from the few things that I've seen, he's got a little bit of that 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 charm, that kind of that. Like I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. I, I don't know. I, 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 clearly, I'm not great at articulating it, but he has that something where when he's when he's trying to put on the charm, he can put it on. Harrison Ford, anytime he tries to put it on, put on the charm, he aside from his performances, largely in Empire Strikes Back, 
Not all of it. I actually was watching it the other day on my VHS player here. Uh, and he does have... He is a little stilted in some of the scenes, you know, in the romance part of it. But, like, a lot of the Falcon scenes are really good. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, there was a relationship of sorts. I'm not saying that they were dating or anything, but I think him and Carrie Fisher, which you would expect to be. If, if two actors don't hate each other and they're, they're having to, you know, and they're on set every day together and they're, they're you know, they're, they're doing these romantic scenes, it, I think it's natural. Hey, she's attractive. He's an attractive guy. It doesn't mean that they love each other or they fall in love, but, you know, you're going you're gonna to develop a fondness, and I think that does, that helps loosen them up, both of them. I think Carrie Fisher... I think maybe had a little more natural, uh, romantical type things to her. Like she softened very well. She was good at being like hard-nosed princess, but she did a pretty good job of softening. And I would say softening while remaining hard. Like when she, you know, when he's he's like, uh, "Don't worry, soon we'll be out. Of, soon we'll be gone." And then she looks at him and says, "Well, then you're as good as gone, aren't you?" It's not a lovey-dovey like. And you're gonna, gonna, like she does. She doesn't play it up, but it's it's that softness, that that tenderness, while still being kind of not gruff, but being more. You know, it's not. I, I'm not being 100 percent vulnerable. I'm not going to say that this bothers me, but you can tell by how I say it that it really bothers me that you're not going to be here. You know. And but and Harrison Ford does get there, and I think I think because. Now, I don't know what order they shot it in, but I would venture to guess, I could be wrong, venture to guess, that the better scenes between the two, the, the more chemistry they seem to have, the, the more natural Harrison Ford's romantical progression are the ones that have happened after he and Carrie Fisher have, you know, had more time together and, and gotten more comfortable with each other. Imagine being a voice actor, and that's your that's your deal for the day. That's that. This is this is your thing. I'm sure there were other things. This concludes the sounds of Scarlet sleeping. Tape number forty-eight. Somebody there. Oh crap! Like like <laughs> the voice actor comes in. All right, uh, we're just gonna need you to snore for about twenty seconds. Of course, they'd do like seventeen takes of it because you always do. And then uh, someone there. That's it. That's all we need. Okay, that's good for today. Happy to work to you with you tomorrow. All right, you know, good to see you. We'll, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I, like I said, I'm pretty sure it was that was part of... I mean, they may have actually done all of that voice actors. Although, I think... I read somewhere as well that it's the same voice actor that does either Moxie and or Lilith. Like, there, there is one voice actress in this series who plays a lot of roles. So, uh, she may have had more. But, I, but, like, there are some roles where it literally is just that. Like, hey, we just need to do this, you know, this little bit today. That's all, that's all we have on the docket. We're still getting the other lines approved or whatever. We just need you to come in and snore on, on into the microphone for a little while. But yeah, so I, I like I understand why I have an understanding of why Mark Hamill's career may not have taken off, really. As an on-screen actor, obviously as a voiceover actor, we, we've seen and, and would not deny it. He's great in embracing these. Again, it's kind of the same thing as with with, with where his performances are: high energy, high emotion type thing like the Joker you know like hey, maniacal hey, uh, laughing and, and this kind of boisterous personality and I mean he really does change his voice it almost makes me wonder if he goes into a completely different headspace but that's not for me to decide um, but yeah you can kind of see that same thing with Daisy Ridley a little bit that I've seen I'm like okay yeah she's, she's, but I don't think Jennifer Lawrence had some amazing thing either and I thought she was fine but she wasn't like amazing there's just there's a lot of it's it's you find out very early on and this is not coming from a jaded place I mean the, the days where I was you know embittered because I couldn't you know it was, it was hard trying to break in the industry as I said before I was not willing to go to California or L A or L A or New York so you know I was kind of doing it to myself but even if I did I I, I don't I'm not in the illusion that I would have I would have made an name for myself a lot of actors who are you know the character actors the ones that aren't the stars I think a lot of them have a lot more chops and probably a, a, a better uh, you know, probably some more talent than than a lot of these stars I think most of the stars they're known for doing a thing a certain way and you can kind of present them in a different style but overall it, you're, you're getting mostly the same kind of performances and, and I think that's 
also shown, not definitively shown, but also shown when you get actors like Jim Carrey or uh, Adam Sandler, who they have these one-offs of dramatic roles that they do pretty well in, that they're actually believable in, but either the movie doesn't do great or it does okay, but they don't make a, they don't start having a dramatic career or a, or a less comedic career because they get the audience wants to see them for a certain thing. It's like if, if I want to see a drama, I'll I want to see a different actor. I, I, I like you because you're Happy Gilmore. I like you because you're, you know, you're, you're this kind of you're, 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 you're the rubber faced comedian. I'm not looking to you to do a highly dramatic role. And I think Hollywood is kind of the same way. So you really you're not. It's I think it's few few and far between times that we are going to see an actor very out of character where you just don't see the act at all I haven't seen Penguin but I understand Colin Farrell I think that's that's the actor. Uh, you know like just even the makeup as people have noted and I would agree the makeup it makes him completely unrecognizable now, whether or not that's a good thing or not I mean I guess it's fine but like I, he seems to be somebody who has had a performance where he's lost in the character Daniel Day-Lewis as much as I'm not a big fan of, of method acting and I, I think it's unnecessary it's hard to deny that he seems to be these different characters. Uh, you know, he, he does a great job uh, in, in Last Mohicans, and even though I wasn't a fan of... Uh, it's not no, no Country for Old Men. What is it? I can't remember. The, the one where he plays the... the he's a bad guy. Oh, yeah, he also plays a bad guy in Gangs of New York, I think. Anyway. But, you know, there, there are some who are able to do very drastically different roles, but they typically don't play a lot of different... A lot of different... They're not. They're not the... Action star kind of kind of character. They'll 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 play a one role every five or ten years. But yeah, I mean Harrison Ford. I mean I, I enjoy him in the movies he does. I like I like his characters, but they're not they're not drastically different. He, he doesn't have display a wide range. And outside of, of Empire, I've found any of his romantic performances or or you know love 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 connections or interactions to be largely unbelievable and stilted. I know I use that word a lot, but that's kind of the... It's not quite wooden. Wooden is, is like, completely just absolutely... Like, oh, I got... Like, he's not... He's not... He still can act. He's just not particularly great in those. And the one time... The I, the one exception for me is, is Empire, and I think that was because one of the director. I think the director was good at getting those performances out. Whatever he did, however he did it, I think he he was able to coax a, a solid performance out of Harrison Ford. And then also his familiarity and comfort level with Carrie Fisher, because they did do Star Wars together. And even though they weren't obviously like you know, half the movie, over half the movie, they're not. Re yeah, yeah, I mean that's a, okay. Yeah, he he was in the movie with Carrie Fisher, but if you look at the amount of scenes they're in together, very few. You've got Scarlet. I would like to touch you in places. Oh, Scarlet. Oh God, did you find one of his songs? Musical gonorrhea. Still, you found all of his tapes. Better return them to him and wash it. Musical hands gonorrhea up. actually Ooh. is uh, is a little is a little light for 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 what that was. Well, the the title anyway. The little bit that we heard that was musical gonorrhea, but just the the notion of the song is like oh, it really is grotesque. They do not they do not overstate her reaction to to Herbert. <laughs> Yeah. Like Harrison Ford is good in action scenes. I mean, that's why. I mean, he, he was great as Jack Ryan. He was great in The Fugitive. But oh, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, if you think about the amount of times that Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, and Mark Hamill were together in Star Wars, it's the Escape from the Death Star. That's pretty much it, and the celebration at the end. That's really it. So the vast majority of the runtime. And, you know, their onset time wasn't there. Probably the trash compactor in the original was probably, I'm guessing, one of the longest scenes. You know, they were probably there for a couple days. Because, you know, they would have to take them out. They don't want them getting, getting all pruney or whatever. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what the conditions were back then. But I, I would imagine there was enough in there that they probably had. I would want to get it out as a director. I'd want to get it knocked out in a day. Because I don't want to have to keep doing the hair and the makeup and getting them all, you know, wet and everything and whatever. But, um... I can imagine that being a two or three day shoot. 
But yeah, they just didn't they didn't they didn't spend a whole lot. So Empire was really when Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher, at least in, as a professional thing. Now, what if they hung out on set after, or you know, after, after you know, or they hung out outside of the set during the shooting of Star Wars? You know, because they were you know on on location and they were in a hotel together and they went to dinner, or whatever. That I could I could see. But you have you know, I'm sure the conditions were much different in Empire. I mean, you have the the they're now stars because of the first movie. So I'm sure the accommodations were nicer. They, you know, they had a, a much more a higher familiarity with each other, and I, I can imagine they, they had more time, more opportunities to spend time together. Outside of the, of the shooting schedule, but even within the shooting schedule, he and he and Leia were were pretty much inseparable. They they had a few scenes where they weren't together, but most of the scenes, they're joined at the hip. Whereas, like in Indiana Jones, he has a love interest in all three, but they're different women each time, and I don't think Harrison Ford really ever got comfortable enough with them to be to be genuine. He, he had the, like, I'm given a pickup line, but it's the cheesy, like, roll your eyes kind of pickup line in delivery. It's not the, ooh, makes your heart flutter kind of thing. And I'm not talking about him personally, but just, uh, the, I don't imagine a woman going, oh, wow, that, that just makes me melt. You know, he's going like, well, you know, I... I am actually. Did you fall from heaven? Because it looks like you face planted. You know, it's like that's that's not that's not romantical. That that doesn't that doesn't win hearts. So there we go. I've covered everything that needs to be covered about that topic. Where are we at time wise on here? I I just don't want to get into a uh, another tirade of some kind and, and get cut off. I think that did happen on the first recording. I started started going and suddenly the the video just cut off and i was like oh crap i didn't even say goodbye so i don't know <sighs> but i know i did not talk about han solo and star wars and the actors the entire time either to the detriment because on, on hunt and fetch quest what are you going to talk about like no, no, the, the, there's no there's no big bad you're going after i did mention you know i'm much more keen on quests where there is a big bad where you know like whether it's what was it Shank, I think from the in the first movie, like they had a lot of not the first movie, the first game, and even in this one they have you know a mission where it's like get this from this person. You actually give the character a name. It's not just another. It's not a hunt and quest, hunt, hunt and fetch. Right now we're looking for the X that marks the spot. I remembered that it was here. I, I was like I know it's close, but I don't remember exactly where it was. But I remember finding it. And so I'm, I'm determined, like a dog with a bone, to find the stupid X without looking on the internet. Because I, I, I did that once. I, I remember looking for it, looking for it. I couldn't find it. It may not have been this one. It may have been a different one. There's one that I just, I, no matter how much I looked, I couldn't find the dang thing. And so I looked it up. And as is the case with a lot of stuff, when you don't earn it, you don't remember it. I think most of the other X's I found pretty quick because I searched and searched and searched and finally found them. And so it was kind of burned into my brain here. Even though I searched and searched and searched, I didn't find it. And so then when I go to look for it, uh, it's just, it's not quite as etched in the old noggin. But that's what I'm doing. So it's like, what, what do you what do you talk about while you're doing that? I would just be saying, oh, I gotta find it. Is it, was it over here? I could've sworn it was, could've sworn, no, it wasn't in there. It was on dirt. I thought it was on dirt. I was pretty sure it was on dirt. It's definitely not in here, but see, I, I'm looking. Maybe, well, maybe it is here because I've already looked in the places I thought it was. And yeah, is that compelling? Is is that enjoyable? I don't know. Perhaps more so if you're not a Star Wars. If you're watching this for Borderlands too, and you're like, I don't give a crap about Star Wars or any of the actors or anything about that, you're probably like, there it is. Yeah. See, it wasn't it wasn't a mind blowing thing, but it was. I will say because you know it's in the dirt and it's off on the side here, it is a little bit harder. Myself, I'd let him kill me, but I, I couldn't let it. I, I fought back. I deck is sticky with their blood. <laughs> Today, they finally met the fearsome Captain Blade. No, it's, it's a great little character arc there. You, guy seems he's got this reputation. He's like, oh, it's, it's not me. It's not how I am. I'm just trying to get by, trying to do things. I was going to let him kill me. But I couldn't do it. And most of us can't. 
Most of us can't. E even people who would say, I had a co-worker, briefly a co-worker, who said that he would he would rather let somebody kill him than take somebody else's life. Even if that person is trying to kill him, even if it's to save his own life, he wouldn't take another life. And I, I'm, I'm willing to give him that. I'm willing to give him that. I'm not, I wouldn't, I didn't challenge him on that. I, I did, because, you know, he was like, oh, it's not, never right to take a life. And I was like, well, what if they were trying to kill your wife? No, oh, that's a little different. And then, well, then, but then you have to adjust your stance. You can't say, well, I'm not about taking another life. It's, I, well, I, I don't, I don't value, I value every, any other lives except higher than mine. But when it comes down to my wife, I value her life more than theirs. So it's like, eh, but you're still killing. And so you can't really say that you wouldn't kill to save a life. You just wouldn't do it for your own, for whatever reason. You don't think that's worth a damn. Like, you'd rather have a, a murderer. And that's that's the selfish part about it. If you think about it, the result of that. You're a good guy. You don't go around hurting and killing people. You're taking up a certain amount of resources in the world. You're you're interacting with certain people. And but you're you're a good guy. You're a nice guy and 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 so you you having a place in this world makes sense and it's it's good. It's it's it, the world is a better place for having you in it. This psycho that's trying to murder you though. Uh he's also taking up resources. He's also interacting with people and I guarantee you those interactions are not going as well. And if he's doing it to you, he's trying to do it to you, he's probably willing to do it to other people. So you're not being selfless, you're actually being a jerk because now you're taking, you're allow, if you allow him to kill you because you don't want to take his life, you're taking yourself, a nice amicable human being, out of circulation and you're leaving a murderer in circulation. So you may have, you may not want to save your own life, but what's to stop somebody, if that guy kills you, well, why do you think he wouldn't kill somebody else in the future? So while it seems on the on the face of it, it seems to be benevolent and oh you're so nice, it's actually highly irresponsible and stupid. But that's that's how warped goodness has be become in, in this world, where people see that as some kind of virtue, see that as some kind of what I I, I don't know I, I don't know how they see it as anything positive, but they do. And it's it's not only it's not it's not that it's not only virtuous, it's the opposite. It's actually detrimental. You're actually doing a disservice to the rest of the freaking world and to future victims. It's like, hey, if you had if you defended yourself, you may have felt bad about it. But in defending yourself, and, and again, we can never know this unless you know you, you you have you get you know some somehow get the bigger picture, or you have some you know alternate timeline or time travel. You really can't know. But you know, with a recurrence rate of like 35 percent in some crimes, even higher in others. Like once a human is willing to crack that barrier, is willing to say, you know what, there are there are reasons other than self-preservation, and you know the defense of my freedoms or, or you know, other people's freedoms. That beyond those reasons, I think I have the right and, and uh, wherewithal to kill somebody. There's no reason to think that wouldn't be done again. And so leaving somebody like that alive. When you, when you, because in, in, in the fictional scenario, in, the, in theory, it's like, would you rather kill or be killed? It's inferring that you have the capacity to kill that person. So, in defending yourself, you're not only defending your own life, which is kind of a smart, evolutionarily sound, and honestly, I'd say biblical sound, way of living, if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. It's also protecting society, it's also defending society from. Somebody who clearly has no respect for it, and, that, and that's that's the problem with a lot of this stuff out there. It's it's not a net zero, so it's not well. You didn't do a good thing, but you didn't do a bad thing. No, no, it's it's a swing. You, you again, you, you didn't, it wasn't just oh, the world Once lost a great person. Yeah, I see you go inside. I was like, he doesn't even have a bed. Well, I guess he does have a bed. Yeah, yeah, but you don't want to get near that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a quick little look. He's got a shrine, and that's about it. Don't know how he gets power or plumbing there. I think that's what I meant. He probably just has a hole in the back where he just literally craps through the hole and just drops down to the canyon. Thankfully, the game does not get that explicit or that detailed. We don't need to know. And there's no way in heck shooting that did, did no damage to the to the Oops. container at all. Actually, broke the compass. I think that's shenanigans. Don't blame me. You busted the compass because you were irresponsible and you were making. Horrible, disgusting Wait, tape. Uh, I can make a replacement. I just need parts. Just get to the Washburn Refinery. Go, go, go! 
So there we go. We're going to be on another fetch quest next time. I think we've got one or two more episodes left. We'll have to wait and see. But thanks so much for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.